Um, I, I'm, I'm, going, I'm going to tell you about uh, well the work I'm doing, which is uh, essentially, or at least part of it, uh, deals with the, with the application of uh, modeling through population dynamics of uh, biomedical problems. And uh, well, this is this is the outline of the talk. So first, I will kind of well introduce the topic, and then I will move uh, to th three particular examples of uh, actual work uh, that I that. Uh, my collaborators and I have done uh, apply, applying these population dynamics concepts to um, <clears throat> uh, problems in biomedicine. So uh, basically, uh, well, for, first thing, I mean, what, what population dynamics is? So basically, it's just the, 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 the study or the analysis of uh, how uh, individuals of different types of or species or whatever uh, interact, uh, compete for existing resources, and evolve. Uh, in order to adapt to, uh, you know, changing environments and, and things like that. Okay, so and uh, many biomedical well, this this uh, this framework is of course very general, and, and many biomedical problems kind of fit within uh, within this framework. So, for example, you can think in if you think in in in, in cancer evolution, uh, the, I mean, this is basically a process of competition between normal and mm, cancer malignant cells for space and resources. So, I mean. And uh, also, in, in during viral infections, um, there is uh, there are, there are uh, interactions between uh, different cell populations. So, for example, the cells of the immune system and the uh, population of, of, of infected cells. And also, uh, there, there are uh, there are problems in uh, evolution with evolutionary dynamics, which I will not deal with them directly in this talk. But they are also important because they are related to uh, things like uh, evolution of drug resistance. In a number of con uh, of contexts like uh, cancer or bacterial infection, uh, things like that. So, uh, by the way, if uh, you have any question, please stop me at any time. I'm happy to answer whatever question you have. Uh, so, the, the, my, my aim for this talk is uh, to illustrate how uh, the concepts and techniques from the mathematical theory of population dynamics can be used to uh, to address this sort of problem. And uh, well hopefully shed some light on a number of uh, relevant issues for uh, you know, the biomedical community. Okay, so uh, how we do actually do this? So basically, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, a mathematical model of, of, of a population is uh, basically composed of, of well, the population that is composed of, of different types. Basically, what, what it does, it keeps track of the, of the number or the densities of the different species in the population, right? And, and it does so as a function of a number of parameters, right? And these parameters are typically uh, birth and death rates, uh, metabolic rates, uh, that is the, the rate at which uh, individuals kind of consume their resources present in the environment, mutation rates, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So, and, um, well, the different, the different type of models, or at least that's, you know, my, my, my take on this subject is that the different type of models basically deal or, uh, with how you get around getting these this, this parameters. So, and uh, basically that, that this defines the type of model, uh, it, it, the complexity of the model and also the scope of application, how, you know, to how many things you can, you can apply that model. So, uh, I, I divide this in a, well, this is, this is a completely arbitrary division, but um, you know, it helps me to rationalize. Uh, what, what, we are, what we are doing. So basically, uh, we, we can deal with homogeneous population where all the individuals uh, share exactly the same parameter values, okay? So, and uh, then you can have, uh, in contrast to this first type of population, you can have a heterogeneous population in which, uh, well, these are, these are a structured population model where the parameters depend on a, on a certain structure variable. So, uh, for example, different type of individuals can have different birth and death rates. Or, I mean, all these things can depend on age. So, for example, the birth rate can depend on, on the age. I mean, you have typically uh, not all the individuals in a population uh, kind of have the same proliferative potential uh, independent of age. So you can, you, can, you can introduce all these factors uh, through a kind of this kind of a structure value, uh, variable. Okay? And uh, then you have... Uh, uh, a third type of population where uh, this is not eternal variables, this external variable, uh, where you have this kind of external variables which control uh, the values of these parameters. And uh, we, we, we refer to these models as uh, multi-scale population models 
where uh, this population dynamics here uh, must be supplemented with additional models uh, of how uh, these parameters depend on these external variables. So for example, uh, something that I will talk uh, about later is how uh, uh, things like uh, substances like oxygen or several signaling cues uh, control uh, the length of the cell cycle or you know, the, the control of, of, this, of this rate by, by drugs. So these multi-scale models basically have a, a, a kind of a, of a layer or a component that it's uh, the typical and classical population dynamics, but then they are, they are, they are, they are added uh, to by these, these additional models which gives us how the, this, all these parameters depend on, on environmental uh, variables. Uh, any questions so far? And uh, so, well, basically, the, 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 this, the different models uh, have different scopes associated to the range of validity. So, for example, this, this one here, the homogeneous population uh, one, is the one that, uh, well, it, it, um, uh, it's, it's as good as this, uh, as this assumption that all the parameters, you know, all the, popul all the individuals in the population have the same, the same parameter value. Okay? And if you look at this list in this direction, they also have, they are, they are increasingly complex both uh, uh, technically and, and also conceptually. So, and uh, uh, when one is trying to model some sort of phenomenon, we, I mean, we, one must decide on, uh, you know, at which level you are here. And that choice is, is I'm afraid, it's rather arbitrary. I mean, and, and basically, it depends on the amount of information you have and uh, which type of question you, you want to answer. So basically, what I'm... Uh, the remaining of this talk is basically uh, devoted to show examples of how these three frameworks, uh, the homogeneous population, the heterogeneous population, and this multiscale population, are applied to uh, different problems of uh, well, some bio biomedical significance. So uh, the first one of these, which corresponds to the, to the homogeneous population, a population in which all the, all the, all the individuals are, su are supposed to behave in the same way, is uh, basically a mathematical modeling a mathematical model of, of, of breast cancer. Uh, sorry, of breast cancer dormancy. So uh, basically, tumor dormancy refers to uh, basically an extended period of growth restriction uh, of undetected metastasis following uh, surgical removal of the primary tumor. Okay? So basically, this is, this is actually what kills uh, most of the patients. So you, you probably know this, uh, that uh, well, you know, the primary tumor kind of sheds uh, metastasis which uh, disperse over the organism and they stay there kind of uh, hidden uh, waiting for something to happen and this this condition this this long uh, per periods of, of latency uh, is, is referred to as dormancy okay and in the case in the particular case of breast cancer this uh, can occur as, uh, as late as 25 years after after resection of the primary tumor so this means that the period, this period of dormancy can be as long as 25 years. And um, this uh, long duration between, between resection and, and relapse is, is, can, cannot be, well, at least there, there has been actually a lot of mathematical modeling work on this. And there is, uh, there, there is no way in which this fact can be reconciled with uh, a continuous uh, growth of the of the secondary tumors of the of the of the metastasis. So the conclusion is that there must be uh, some sort of of, of uh, dormancy latency period in there. And there has been based based on on experimental models, there are three mechanisms that have been proposed uh, to explain uh, tumor dormancy. And one is simply that uh, um, these uh, these uh, these metastases are composed by solitary cells. Uh, which persist in a quiescent state for months or even years. Uh, then a second model proposes that, uh, uh, that, that there are, there are uh, micrometastases which are non-vascularized and non-angiogenic, that is, they, they, are, they cannot grow, basically, and they are restricted to a size of uh, one or two millimeters, which is, this is basically, at least by, by, by standard techniques, these are basically undetectable in the clinic. So, uh, patients which have this sort of micrometastasis would go through as, as cured patients when they are submitted to uh, some, some sort of, of examination in the clinic. And then the third hypothesis, hypothesis is that uh, these met, this met metastases are, are, well, can be vascularized and, and angiogenic, 
but they are held as, at some equilibrium size of this of this order by the action of the immune system. Okay. So what I'm going to show you is that uh, by, by 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 proposing a, a mathematical modeling model and applying it to to uh, empirical data, uh, we have identified that this is probably uh, well. We, we have reasons to think that the second scenario is the is the one that that, that it's really happening. Okay. So well, that that's that's obvious. That's obviously a hypothesis. I mean, we are not. This is this is just a mathematical model, so we don't provide definitive answers, but. At least we have provided some sort of rationale to believe that this second scenario is the more is the more likely. Okay, so uh, I'm I'm not going to show you any equations whatsoever. Uh, so I will go through a verbal uh, description of the of the of the model. So in the in this particular case, the model describes the the, the, the dynamics of a, a homogeneous population of micrometastases in one single patient at time t for detection. So this. N of t is the number of micrometastases in, in one particular patient. Uh, t years later, uh, she undergo, underwent uh, uh, surgery. Okay. So at, at time equal zero, this is the time. This is the time of, of, of the operation of time. The time of resection. Uh, the number of, of metastases seeded already by the by the primary tumor is supposed to be a random uh, variable distributed. Uh, according to a, to a Poisson distribution, and it has these this, uh, this parameters. Okay. So uh, the dynamics of, this, of the population of, of, of micrometastasis is, uh, is given by uh, this, this model. So at, at, any, at, at any time, one of these three uh, events can occur. So a new metastasis is seeded. That means that the number of metastases is increased by one. Uh, and this occurs with a probability rate equal to uh, lambda, this parameter here. Metastasis disappear just by, by random effects. I mean, these are, these are small metastases, so they can just uh, disappear by, by random fluctuations or by the action of uh, the immune system or a number of, of different factors. And we are, we, we are assuming that this is, uh, that this occurs with a probability rate equal to mu. mu. And then uh, there is uh, a growth event, uh, which basically corresponds, or would correspond to a mutation uh, that uh, causes the escape from the from the growth restriction. So this would be, for example, a switch from the non-angiogenic to the angiogenic uh, phenotype, which are which um, would trigger this escape from the from the growth restriction. Okay, and this uh, kind of growth event occurs uh, at a probability at a constant probability rate rate equal to kappa. Okay, so so basically when this when this um, when this event occurs, we assume that uh, relapse occurs with probability one after some time. So, okay. so um, the way I mean this 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 verbal description of the model can be put in, in to, into a mathematical form using uh, using the theory of Markov processes, and uh, we can we can analyze the the, the model uh, by two methods basically by direct simulation. Of this uh, of this stochastic process, or by a numerical solution of the corresponding differential equation. Okay, and uh, these parameter values here, all these all these uh, different parameters, are determined from uh, estimates uh, uh, in the in the relevant literature. So there are, there are there are some there are some if if you look in the literature, there are basically some bounds on uh, the values of this of this parameter of these parameter values. And also, we have uh, fitted uh, our model to uh, relapse data from this uh, database, the Early Breast Cancer Trialist Collaborative Group database, uh, using approximate uh, Bayesian, Bayesian computation uh, subject to a number of statistics. Okay. And uh, uh, the result of these simulations is that. Uh, the number of metastases. So, if you if you take if you take this model and you run it for for, for some time, what you see this is this is the, the basically the, the, the histogram of the number of of um, uh, so ba basically the number each each he, here each realization of the model provides the uh, evolution of one single patient. So here, what we have done is to uh, bin all the realizations or all the patients with 
uh, one micrometastasis or with two micrometastasis, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And what we see is that as time goes by, independent of the parameter values, uh, this, uh, this uh, distribution peaks around one single metastasis. Okay, so this goes back to the to the this, these three models and these three scenarios in which, uh, well, we, we we basically claim that tumor dormancy is is sustained by a small number of metastases. Uh, according to our model, this this uh, this would be this would be equal to one. And uh, to check this this hypothesis, which we get from so basically our hypothesis is that dormancy is sustained by a small number of metastases. So basically, we need we need to check this. We need to validate this this hypothesis. And basically, what we did, we went to the to this uh, to this database of um, of uh, data for 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 relapse of, of breast cancer uh, patients. And um, so uh, and and we 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 we, we checked that uh, it, it it seems uh, it it is it is compatible with the data that long term dormancy is maintained by uh, one to five uh, micrometastases. So basically, what we did here. Is um, this is uh, this is this is the, these are the results of the of the um, of the Bayesian uh, analysis, and basically what this figure shows is uh, for all viable uh, values of of the of the um, of the rate at which the growth event occurs, right? Uh, we we plot the frequency with which uh, these dormancy patients have less than or equal to three, five, or ten metastases. Uh, this is for ten, 10 years after resection, and this is for 20 years after resection. And uh, what we what we saw is that if the if the growth event uh, has a half life of 69 years, well, this half lifetime is basically the, the inverse of the value of, the, of kappa. Okay. So if this is if this is uh, less than than 69 years or less, 60 percent. Of the of the of the patients um, would have uh, less than five micrometastases, and if this is uh, if the uh, half lifetime of the of the growth event is uh, 23 years, then 80 percent of the patients would have between one and three micrometastases. Okay, so this data seems to support or at least uh, be it is, is, co is compatible with our hypothesis that. Um, uh, tumor dormancy is is maintained uh, in the long term, uh, in the long run, by a small number of, of small metastases. Okay. So any any question so far? So this is uh, well. This is basically it uh, for this uh, cancer dormancy problem. So now I'm going to move to a, to the second type of of of, uh, of mathematical framework. This uh, structured population, this heterogeneous population. And in particular, I'm going to look at um, a, a mechanism for for, yeah, for evolutionary escape based on the existence of a, of a quiescent or a latent subpopulation. Okay. So, uh, what is evolutionary escape? So, well, it, it, the, this is this evolutionary escape is basically an evolution a mechanism for evolution of resistance to drugs, and and uh, well, this this evolution of resistance to drugs is observed in many. Uh, Pathological, um, pathological situation. So, um, basically, the, the 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 standard theoretical model to explain this this evolutionary escape is is uh, was was formulated by uh, Iwasa and and, and, and co-workers in this in these references here. So, basically, uh, what the, this this uh, this model is based on a on a random search. Uh, on in, in genotype in genotype space driven by uh, by genetic mutation, so basically what happens is that you have you have mutations and then you are going to move from one point to another in this in this uh, genotype space, and uh, the the presence of the drug acts as a as a selective pressure, uh, driving this random uh, search toward uh, towards uh, genotypes that uh, gives uh, some surviving uh, probability. Some surviving advantage to 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 that to that drug in the presence of the drug. Okay. So and what what we have uh, done here is that we have put forward a, a, an alternative mechanism based on a, on a structure uh, population 
and uh, basic, in, on, in particular on the emergence of a small subpopulation uh, of quiescent cells, which um, uh, do not proliferate, but they are, they are uh, insensitive to the drug. So this, this mechanism is basically based on, on the effect of hypoxia on, on chemotherapy and radiotherapy. So hypoxia means low levels of, of oxygen. So basically what happens is that uh, hypoxic regions are, uh, in, within a tumor are resistant to uh, chemotherapy and radiotherapy. So this is basically uh, due to the fact that, uh, sorry. Um, yeah, so uh, basically this, this, these therapies are designed to kill uh, cells that uh, proliferate fast. In the presence of, of, well, or in the absence of oxygen, cells tend to divide at a much slower rate. And this means that uh, uh, therapies like chemotherapy and radiotherapy are less effective. So this, this was kind of the original rationale for this, for this model. But then uh, we realized, or well, we were suggested that uh, there are two different contexts in which this, this, may be, this may be important. One is bacterial persistence, and uh, the other one is the, is the presence of this latent reservoir in, in HIV patients. And basically, what happens here is that this would be, this is the, uh, so for example, in the, in, the bacterial, in the bacteria case, this is the, uh, uh, the number of, of, uh, of bacteria uh, as a function of time after the, uh, the administration of some antibiotic. And what you see here is a, is a kind of bimodal behavior. So he, first, you have an exponential decay of the, of the population, but at some, uh, th there is some crossover here, some time at which uh, the slope of this curve kind of, of changes and, and the killing of the bacteria by the antibiotic becomes, uh, more, becomes less efficient than in this initial phase. And uh, the reason for this seems to be uh, exactly what we are proposing here, that there, are, there is a, 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 a subpopulation of, of bacteria called persisters that uh, they are not proliferating, but they are insensitive to the drug. And, and something similar happens in, in, in HIV. So the, when, when you have a patient under, 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 under treatment, first you have uh, a period in which you have basically an exponential decay of, of, the, of the infected uh, T cells, but at some point uh, there is here. So, well, here, here in the case of the HIV, you have these blips, which have a, a, a different phenomenology, but, um, but the, the, you, you, you observe exactly the same behavior as here. So you first observe an exponential decay of the infected T cells, and then uh, some sort of, of plateau uh, behavior. And again, this, 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 this seems to be uh, down to the presence of, of a subpopulation, which is not uh, producing virus, but it's insensitive to the, to the therapy. Okay? So this model seems to be, this model could be also useful for these uh, field types. So basically, uh, what we consider uh, it's uh, basically, in, in our model, uh, three different types of individuals. Uh, basically, type 1 and type 2 uh, have similar preparation and death rates when no drug is, pre is present. But the, the, the difference between type 1 and type 2 is that uh, the drug is, li is lethal to type uh, to 2, but it's neutral to 1. So basically, the uh, individual of the, of the type 1 are, are uh, insensitive to the drug. And they are. And uh, the question we, we, we want to address is under which circumstances the presence of, uh, of a third type of individual, which states in a dormant state, but, it's in sense, but it is also insensitive to the drug, can rescue the population from, from extinction. So basically, whether the, 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 the a dormant or acquiescent subpopulation is able to rescue, uh, to produce this evolution, right? to produce this, this escape right? from, the, from the action of the drug. And, uh, well, I'm not going to give you more uh, any of the details, but the, 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 the answer to this question is, 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 is yes. So you have, if you have, if you have a, a, a quiescent subpopulation, uh, you can escape the action. So, so this, is, this is basically the, the probability that the whole population survives as a function of, of, of one, 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 one of the parameter models. But basically what happens is that if you don't have, if you don't have the quiescent population, the probability of survival is equal is is basically zero, uh, regardless of the of the value of these parameters. Whereas, if uh, if you have a quiescent uh, subpopulation, uh, then 
uh, for some, in, in, at least in some regions of the parameter space, you can have uh, your population to survive. You have a non-zero population, a non-zero probability of survival. So this is this is basically the mechanism for escape. And uh, the mechanism is basically illustrated here. So these are these are two different uh, realizations of the of the of the of the population dynamics. And what you see here is that this is this is without uh, this is without the 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 quiescent population, right? And what what happens is that uh, well the population gets gets extinct. Whereas here, it, when when you have when you have a quiescent population, there is uh, the, the types one and two, which are represented here by the green and, and, and red lines, basically get extinct. But uh, the quiescent population stays stays there. This is the, the, the blue one. At a, some sort of, of, of a steady a steady value. So basically, what what this provides is a buffer for the for the population to to kind of uh, hide there from the from the drug. And then at the moment the drug wears off, which is what happens here. Uh, the population kind of regrows from that uh, from that quiescent uh, subpopulation. Okay. So I think I'm going to skip that. So basically, uh, so the, the, the quiescent kind of uh, it's, it's, it's a feasible mechanism for rescue uh, population under under stress uh, from extinction. And and uh, and the, the, the interesting thing here is that uh, quiescent gives an evolutionary advantage. In the presence of the drug, but uh, it's not. It doesn't involve an increase of, of uh, well, this thing we, we, we would call fitness or the net reproduction rate of of the population. So basically, as opposed to the mechanism proposed by by Iwasa. So the mechanism proposed by Iwasa basically was a random search in which you will end up in a genotype that has a very uh, fast uh, reproduction rate. So and and therefore you can survive the action of the drug. This mechanism is based on a completely different principle. It's basically pretty, the, the quiescent subpopulation provides a buffer where the where the population can survive without increasing the, the net population rate. Okay. So and uh, last but not least, I'm going to discuss this third type of, of, of population model, this multi-scale uh, populations, in which uh, you have uh, you know the birth and death rates are not are not given parameters. They are part of the of the model, and I will I will tell you about this model in the in the context of uh, angiogenesis and, and tumor growth. So basically, this is this is uh, what the model looks like, uh, well, at least a schematic of, of the organization of the model. So and and uh, basically, what what you have here is is a, is a, is a this is this is a very complicated model in which you have different Layers, so, 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 so to speak. So basically, the problem you are interested in, in when, you, when you study uh, tumor growth is the competition between normal cells and cancer cells. So who is going to win and under which conditions uh, normal cells can win cancer cells or, or the other way around. Okay? So here we have, we have a layer in which we have a kind of uh, classical population dynamic uh, model for the competition uh, between these two for uh, space and resources. Here, the resources I are basically oxygen, right? And uh, as I said, uh, um, in, the, in this kind of in this kind of model, uh, the reproduction rates are, uh, are not given parameters. They are basically uh, that they emerge from the dynamics of the model through a kind of intracellular intracellular dynamics. So each one of these cells carry a model of uh, how the cell cycle is 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 controlled. By the amount of oxygen, okay. So this will give us the birth rate, for example, as a function of the local concentration of oxygen. Okay. And uh, there is here an extra layer. This is this is basically the, the, the angiogenesis part of the of the of the model. Okay. So the oxygen, the kind of the fuel for the cells, is uh, provided by the by the vascular by the vascular network. So basically, if there is in the vascular network, there is there is blood flow, and the oxygen arrives to the tissue and to the cells through the blood flow. So basically, and there, there is also a complex interaction here uh, between, uh, between the, especially between the cancer cell population and the, uh, and the vascular network, because uh, when cancer cells are starved uh, uh, from oxygen, and pro well, provided they, 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 they have 
undergo under one, un, undergone the um, antiogenic switch, they will start producing uh, si signaling cues such as uh, this uh, growth factor, this GEPF, uh, that will uh, uh, induce uh, growth of new of new vessels, and that will uh, feed uh, the cancer cells with with new oxygen. So there is there is a very complicated feedback here between uh, the population, the kind of internal dynamics of each one of the cells, and the environment, basically, which is provided by the, by the vascular network. Okay? So what is it? I just said. So, and the, basically, the important thing here is that in this model, the birth and death rates are not given. They emerge from the intracellular models rather than you know, being fitted from uh, uh, the intrapopulation. Okay, and, and well, there is, there is uh, as, as usual, there, is, there, is, there are some, um, uh, I mean, this, this, the, 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 there are limitations here. So here the limitation is that this model is a very, is a very complex one. And this makes the model, uh, the analysis of the model very, very difficult. On the other hand, uh, it opens a very interesting avenue for, for application. Okay. And uh, just to finish, I will show you what uh, basically what what we are doing right now with this model. So basically, uh, what uh, what uh, we are trying to do now is to uh, take uh, uh, this well, real vascular networks taken from from uh, images obtained from from well, these are these are from these are from experiments. These are from uh, chamber experiments in start from uh, in 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 rats. So basically, what what we are doing is we are taking this. Um, we are taking this uh, this image, and then we are, you know, by means of image reconstruction, we are obtaining this kind of um, vascular network, and then we are we are we are feeding this vascular network into our model. So basically, here we have a piece of the a piece of tissue. So this would be uh, this would be normal uh, normal cells. The, this pink one here, and the green ones are a small colony of of tumor cells. Okay. And then we are just uh, running the model and, uh, well, checking how uh, both the vasculature, uh, the vasculature and the blood flow, and um, uh, the colony of tumor cells evolve. Okay. So and uh, uh, well, this, these simulations are basically just an exercise. It's it's kind of a proof of concept. But uh, the point is that we are now in conditions to extract the statistics, rela statistics related to uh, the vascular structure, such as well, microvascular density, distributions of radii, length, uh, uh, blood flow rate, things like that, and uh, also statistics of, of, of tumor evolution, and see how uh, these two things, tumor evolution and, and these uh, statistics, are, are related. And this, such information would constitute uh, I think are very valuable to to evaluate uh, model predictions, especially concerning new 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 therapeutic uh, protocols. Okay. And uh, well, that's it. I'm just uh, uh, so basically we have. Well, uh, I, I hope I have shown you uh, how models of, of population dynamics uh, may provide uh, you know variable insight into into several uh, m medical problems. And uh, I, well, I, I hope I have succeeded in doing this, which was the main point of this talk, to illustrate by, by means of three particular examples uh, the different uh, modeling approaches and what sort of information we can extract from them. And, uh, well, that's it. Uh, just, uh, these, are, these are my collaborators, so basically this is the people involved in the, in the breast cancer modeling, uh, especially her. She's, uh, she, well, she was a PhD student, meaning that she did all the hard work. And the same here, Holger Perfal, who, uh, Perfal, who was a uh, pre-doc at Stuttgart and, and Nottingham, and uh, well, the rest of the people involved in the, in the different projects. And well, if you heard anything interesting that caught your eye, well, go to, uh, you can go to the, to the website of, of uh, our group at the CRM, my personal site, uh, website, or just uh, email me. OK, thank you very much. Well, it's, again, it's been a very nice talk. Thank you very much for it. I would like to make uh, two questions, which mm -hmm. are related. 
the first is, uh, I don't know if I, I lost it, but uh, what about how good are the, the results of your predictions? Have you verified in real situations? Well, that, that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's, well, that's one of the points of this kind of proof of concept exercise. So, so we, will, we want to validate. So the, the, reason, the first thing we will do when we can extract all, the, all, the, all those statistics is that then we can compare with uh, data from you know, similar statistics that have been measured in, in real data. Because otherwise, the only thing you can do is you take a picture of the vasculature, real vasculature, say, and a picture of your model and say, well, they look the same. I mean, that you can, you can, I mean, that's one of the things we want to do by extracting so, this yeah. or validating the model using this statistic. And, okay, and, uh, and the second is, do you have the sensation that you have uh, shown us three uh, increasingly complex types of models, and do you have the sensation that the more complicated, the better? Not in, necessarily. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. As I said, I mean, it depends. It depends on the. It depends on the question you want. You want. You want to ask, and also the information available. Because if you don't have, if you have no information whatsoever about anything in your system, there is absolutely no point in doing a very complicated model. In fact, I think you are much better off. If you do a simple model in which you can just come up with qualitative predictions, um, it, it it depends on the on the actual amount of information you have and the sort of questions you want to ask. So, for example, I mean you can you can with with this model you can just uh, check, for example, uh, uh, how uh, efficient are therapies which which drugs that interact which uh, act on on cells that are at particular stages of the cell cycle. Of course, I mean with with a homogeneous population kind of model, the one in which you have all the, all the, all the parameters constant, you cannot do that because there you only have a, a, a birth rate, which is what it is, and you don't have any information of how that particular parameter depends on, on the environment. But with this third model, with this much more complicated model, you can do that. But it's not necessarily better. It just addresses different questions. Okay, thank you. So one of your models related to these uh, quiescence of mm -hmm. cells provides good insight about uh, how these cells can remain and, mm -hmm. and they do not extinct. But do your models somehow provide any insight on how to fight against these quiescence? What would be an optimal well, strategy? That, 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 would, that would be that's, that's the thing we want to do now. We want to introduce now is control strategies. Yeah. So. Um, but there, there, there we, need, we, need the, we, need, we need to introduce more detail on how this process of, of quiescence actually occurs. Because it's not the same. So for example, the, the model I show you here is very generic. So it could apply the same to bacteria and to HIV and to cancer. But uh, the actual mechanisms for quiescence are quite different. So to go there, you need to provide more detail and then, and then to implement some sort of control strategy. So this is why when, when, when one of the things I, 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 I'm doing right now is basically doing that using the multiscale model in the, in the case of hypoxia and then tumor growth. Thank you. But, yeah. And concerning the multiscale modeling, mm -hmm. one of the difficulties is to, you know, also the different time scales in which well, this process yeah, occurs. Yeah, yeah, so how, how can you simulate that? Well, um, basically what, uh, what, what we are doing is, uh, well, um, there in, in that model, everything is kind of, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a kind of very rough, you know, the, I mean, actually, Juan is already, is already laughing at this. But um, uh, basically, everything is driven by the intracellular dynamics. The intracellular dynamics are modeled in terms of systems of ODEs. So you have this um, mass, law, law of mass action kind of dynamics for the, for the cell cycle. And that's, that's kind of what drives everything else. So basically...